Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. The word of the Lord says this. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for this book of Galatians, and especially chapter 5 as we're working through it. And just trying to figure out uh, your desire for our lives, your will for our lives, as we experience your incredible and unending love for us through this freedom that you have given us. May our words be true to your intended interpretation of these scriptures this morning. May you speak to us, and may we be challenged by your spirit. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Ah, it's good to be together again, isn't it? I love Sunday mornings. I really do. I love the sun. The sun's beautiful. The sun is getting intense. The sun is getting warm. I think yesterday morning around 10 o'clock, I realized I'm sweating really bad. It's just from being in the sun. But it's good to be here. It's good to uh, experience today with you. And it, maybe you're sitting there as we read through the scripture going, okay, where's Scott going to go with this passage today? Rest easy. We're not even going to talk about verse 12. So we're all in good condition. We're all in good shape. You don't have to worry about that. We are going to talk about some good stuff that's found in here, though. If you, Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. The title of the message this morning is called The Perfect Race. And I read an article. Um, I subscribe to Runner's World magazine. There's an article in the latest edition of Runner's World magazine where Nike actually attempted the perfect race. And here's what I mean by the perfect race. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the world record held for running a marathon, 26.2 miles, was run in 2014 by a guy from Ethiopia. He ran it in two hours, two minutes, and 57 seconds. 26.2 miles, he ran in two hours, two minutes, and 57 seconds. If you break that down into time, that is a four minute and 41 second mile for 26 miles. Now, if anything, if you know anything about the running world and the marathon world, which many of you probably don't, two hours and breaking two hours for the marathon is kind of what the four-minute mile used to be 50 years ago. It was thought unachievable. It was thought impossible that nobody could ever break the two-hour marathon. So Nike made an attempt just about a month ago to do that. They attempted to run the perfect race. And here's what Nike did. Nike got three of the top marathoners in the world. They kept them at Nike headquarters. They trained them. They controlled what they ate for a period of approximately six months. And then on a day set in early May, they went to a Formula One race course located in Italy. A one and a half mile lapped course in an attempt to break the two hour marathon. Something that was thought undoable. They controlled as many of the variables as they possibly could. They chose that specific site for its weather conditions. Average degrees, average temperature that time of year, 54 degrees, very low humidity. The site was far enough off the ocean where it wasn't affected by any of the weather tendencies affected with a large body of water. It was also relatively well hidden from any winds. Average wind gusts get there up to 5 miles an hour. It's protected by berms and trees and buildings and things of that nature. That's all good. Nike took it even further. They painted a line, a white line, around that one and a half mile course that the runners would stick specifically on that line. That way they didn't have to go one foot further or one foot shorter than exactly 26.2 miles. Along with that, a pace car was set up to be driven by a professional driver exactly five meters in front of the runners. Because if they were any closer than that, it would negate the attempt because it would be too much windbreak for the runners. On top of the pace car was a clock with the current time, the amount of time that they had been racing, what their current pace was, and what their expected finish time was. 
each runner was wired, I don't know if it was a chest strap or if it was a wristband, they were wired with all their statistics that every 200 meters was uploaded to the pace car in front of them to digitally compute how they were doing in relation to what they were burning calorically, how fast they were running, and all those factors. As if that's not enough, right? There were six pacers that are allowed to run in this marathon as long as they could with these three runners. The six pacers ran in an arrow formation around the three marathoners to why? To reduce the drag and the wind speed on these runners. As if that weren't enough, they also had a mobile fluid station. So on the back stretch, on the straight spot of the course, every time they came around, there was people on mopeds that were going the exact same speed as each runner with each runner's preferred drink or food or whatever intake was so they didn't have to slow down at all to grab water or to rehydrate. When I say they attempted the perfect race, they really attempted the perfect race, didn't they? They controlled as many factors as they possibly could. And for the purest in me, you go... That's not even right, is it? Like, I was just talking with Mark a little bit this morning about volleyball. Like, I love volleyball, but I hate all the rule changes they've done in volleyball to make it more viewer-friendly. Like, Nike controlled everything they possibly could about this race. A guy from Kenya finished the race. Maybe I shouldn't tell you. You guys don't need to know. <laughs> two hours and 24 seconds. 24 seconds over the two-hour mark, which is by far and away a, world, a new record. But if you think about it, the guy who had the previous records at 2 hours, 2 minutes, and 57 seconds, to take it down to under a 2-hour time, you'd have to increase your productivity by 2.4% faster marathon at that level, which is almost unheard of. And let's be honest. For me, I'd look at that and i go, even if they got the record, I'm still going to put an asterisk next to it. Right? Because of all the stuff that went into play, all the things they took care of, it was just almost not right. Because in my opinion, there is no such thing as a perfect race. Similarly, in our faith journey, there's no such thing as a perfect faith journey either. And that's kind of what Paul is stating as he starts here. You're running a good race. Who cut, on you, who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Who cut in on you in your faith journey? What is keeping you from running the race of faith with Jesus Christ? And when Paul wrote these specific words to the Galatians, he had an answer for who that was. He knew who it was. There was somebody specific in mind. The answer to that question was it was the Judaizers. Fundamental Judaism had infected and influenced the church in Galatia very heavily. That's why last week we spent a lot of our sermon, a lot of the message, talking about circumcision. Not specifically the act of circumcision, but just this idea that circumcision was absolutely 100% positively necessary because of what it said in the Old Testament. It was something you had to have done. That's what the Judaizers were saying. Satan was using this trapping of fundamental Judaism to hinder the spread and the prosperity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is alluding to here. We said it last week. They were making rules on what needed to be done to reach maturity in the faith. And they were, reading, they were making rules that need to be done to reach maturity in the faith that didn't come from Christ. They came from human traditions. They came from the things that we've always done. They came from because that's the way it is. And let's be honest, that's not something that's new to the Christian faith. It probably wasn't new at the time, and it isn't even new to us today. We still do those same things. The church in Galatia allowed it to happen. That was the problem. It's not that it wasn't there. It was that they allowed it to happen. Is the church today just as guilty as Galatia? It's fascinating. Many of you who keep on top of the news, I've got to be honest, I was talking with a friend last night, and I said, I don't even follow politics anymore. Like, I rarely follow politics because it's just so crazy. You know, you hear so many things. Here's, here's the story, right? And you hear everything out here, right? You just like a big circle. I Just give me the story. But there was something fascinating that happened in politics this week. There's this guy, Bernie Sanders. Many of you guys have heard of Bernie Sanders. Maybe some of you are feeling the burn at some point. I don't know, right? 
Bernie Sanders was questioning a guy named Russell Vaught. Russell Vaught was a presidential nomination, or is a presidential nomination, for the position of Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. I have no idea what that means, but that's okay. It's an important position, one that is nominated directly by the President of the United States. Okay? Because of that, you have to go through a series of questioning. You have to go through this vetting process to be nominated and to get that position. Bernie Sanders was having an interview, I guess you could say, with this guy, with, with Russell. And he asked the question that made the headlines. Maybe you haven't heard the question. Here's the question that Senator Sanders asked. Do you think that people who are not Christians are condemned? Now, the reason he asked this question was because this Russell Vaught is, I believe, a Wheaton University or Wheaton College graduate. And Wheaton College had some issues with the professor um, and dealing with the issue of homosexuality a couple years ago, and he wrote a position piece on it that Bernie didn't agree with. So when he asked that question, do you think that people who are not Christians are condemned? It was in a United States official sanctioned position, House and nominating committee in front of everybody. It was a faith question about religious beliefs asked in a political spectrum of what we call a confirmation hearing. Now, why is this a big deal? Because if you're asking a specific faith question or a specific religious question in that setting, the United States Constitution forbids it. So some groups jumped on this right away. We're like, whoa, 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 he's way out of line. Other groups jumped on it. I'm like, no, he's perfectly okay in what he was doing. Why did I bring this up? Because when I heard about this, I went on a couple different websites. I went on some conservative websites to see what they were saying. I went on some liberal websites to see what they were saying. Because you know where the truth usually lies? Somewhere in the middle. So it's like trying to put this piece of a puzzle together. So that's what I did. But I was on this website, on the NPR website, and I found an article about it. And, and the article, yes, it was about this, but it, really, it, it threw out these statistics. Listen to this. In regard to a recent Pew Research poll that was conducted regarding Christians and their views on hell. The Pew, uh, Gal the Pew poll found this. 60% of American Christians believe in hell. 60% of American Christians believe in hell. 48% 48 Protest 48 of Protestants and 56% of evangelicals believe Christianity is the only path to eternal life. 48% of Protestants, 56% of evangelicals believe that Christianity is the only path to eternal life. Now, understand, I don't like the way this is worded. Okay? I think it's pretty obvious that if, if you open up the Bible... And what's biblically said suggests that eternal life is existent for all people. It's not eternity in heaven and something else. Eternal life is existent for all people. Jesus didn't tell the story about the sheep and goats and have a third party somewhere. Hey, by the way, I'm going to put the sheep on my right and the goats on my left and the chickens somewhere in between. Right? He didn't throw in another animal. It's eternity, but the choice is yours of where you choose to spend eternity. Along those lines, too, I don't like the wording of the question or the, the, the poll that says Christianity is the only path to eternal life because Christianity isn't the only path to eternal life. Belief in Jesus Christ is. But here's what struck me. Did you pick up on the statistics? Approximately half of people who profess to be Christians in the United States of America today do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to spending eternity in heaven. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Half of us believe that. And that blows me away. Because I don't know how you can read through the Bible and come up with other things. John 14, 6, Jesus answered what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How about this one? Acts 4.12, Paul writes, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Romans 3.22 states that this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
Or maybe the best way to put it is the way Peter put it in John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Guys, the, the Bible is very clear, very clear about belief in Jesus Christ and a relationship with him being the only path to God the Father. If you take the time to read the Bible and actually care and look into the words that are written inside of it, it becomes quite clear that that's the case, even if that conclusion is politically incorrect. Even if it's not popular. You see, the church in general has obviously, according to the statistics of this poll, allowed the message of Christ to become watered down for the sake of acceptance among the masses that it was never intended to appease in the first place. But you're saying, Scott, shouldn't we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are commanded by Christ himself to do it. But Jesus Christ is quoted as saying in all four gospel accounts, either these words or something doggone close to them. Everyone will hate you because of me. Guess what? Following Christ isn't always popular. It's not going to make you popular among men or popular among people. If it was, don't you think everybody you know would be here this morning? Wouldn't every person in your circle of friends be sitting in here? Maybe not because of the annoying pastor, but in a church in general, right? Everyone will hate you because of me, Christ says. I bring all this up, ultimately, because what I've learned is that a runner determines the success or failure of a race on their own terms. Here's what I mean. You ever heard the term pride goes before the fall? The saying, pride goes before the fall? Like, that could be a great moniker for long distance running. Long distance running. I, I mean, I've seen many a runner in a race go out way too fast because you know what? Everybody's excited. Everybody's got energy. And I want to try and keep up with those people. I want to try and keep, beat that person. And then guess what happens when you get to the middle stages or the later stages of a long race? It's not a pretty sight. Muscles are cramping. Fatigue has set in. Things are not going well. And if you were uh, present at our camping weekend last year at Little Pine State Park, you saw that first class right from this guy right here. I mean, it was an ugly, ugly, ugly sight. Because when it's in a long distance race, there are certain conditions that demand a runner slow down. But if you choose to ignore those conditions, then you're going to pay the price at a later time. Maybe you don't drink enough. Maybe you drink too much. Maybe you had poor planning and preparation leading up to the race. You didn't train enough. Maybe you didn't get enough sleep the night before or the week before leading up to it. Maybe your food preparation was way off and you ate something before that race you shouldn't have eaten. Maybe you have bad clothing on. Maybe you chose the wrong shoes that day. And the list could go on and on and on and on. Whatever the cause, short of an act of God, like a thunderstorm or an ice storm or something along those lines, the runner is responsible for ultimately running their own race. And just like many athletes, runners can find things to blame, can't they? Even if the result relies on them. Look, if you were to ask me after the call of the Wilds Marathon last year, I bonked. I crashed. I hit the wall. There's no other way of putting it. I, I, my body shut down on me in a way that I have never experienced before. To put it in perspective, I got done with the first 22 miles of the race in about five hours. It's a 26-mile race. So there was four miles left from the last aid station. Those last four miles, I finished in eight and a half hours. Those last four miles took me three and a half hours after doing the first 22 miles in five hours. I was in bad shape. You know what happened? Here's what happened. It was ridiculously hot and humid. It was ridiculously hot and humid. And I wanted to try and see if I could put in a really good time. You know what else happened? I slept terribly. 
we spent the three nights leading up to that in a camper in the park, which was great. Only it never got below like 80 degrees those nights. You know how well you sleep in a camper in 80 degree weather? Not good. Guys, I could give you a whole laundry list of reasons of why it happened. But you know ultimately why it happened? Because I allowed it to happen. I tried for something that I thought was within my skill set, but was within a little outside of that, unfortunately. I attempted to go too far, too fast for my abilities. Paul asked the question, look, if you're running a good race, why did you stop? And I'm not talking about a trail race or marathon here. That's the, that's the comparison we're using today. In your relationship with Christ, Paul uses this example of racing time after time after time. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who goes into the games goes in to, com goes in to compete, goes into this strict training. They do it, a crown, do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I beat my body and make it my slave so that in the end I will not be disqualified from the prize. This race imagery is something that Paul uses time after time after time again. If you are running a good race, why did you stop? There is no reason to allow false doctrine and hollow arguments to redirect your attention away from God. Verse 8 says what? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. This is not something that's approved of, sanctioned by, or related to a life of Christ. It's the persuasion of the evil one. The one who lies, the one who deceives, Satan, the father of lies himself. He's going to do everything he can to keep you from running a good race. It's what he does. It's who he is. You see, there's a passage of scripture that I hear mentioned often in Christian circles these days. It explains a lot why the beliefs of many Christians don't necessarily line up with the words of scriptures these days. This passage is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. Many of you know it. The words of this passage say this. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. And the verse goes on. This, this verse is what many Christians believe is happening in our society today. And if the statistics from the Pew Research poll that I mentioned early, earlier on are accurate, it would kind of be hard to argue against that. That would definitely support that case, wouldn't it? See, ironically, as I was looking at that stuff, I found a separate Gallup poll that was just released last month. For the first time in the history of our nation, more people believe the Bible to be a collection of fables, history, legends, and moral precepts recorded by man than the actual Word of God. More people in our nation, for the first time in our history, believe this to be a storybook than the Word of God. Guys, when the truths in our lives revolve around what we want them to be instead of what God demands that they are, then the signs would indicate that we, the people of this nation as well as the people of the church of the United States of America, are probably being kept from running a good race in our faith. If what we believe doesn't match up with the words of this book, there's a problem there. Verse 9 says it pretty well, pretty succinctly, pretty simply and easily. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. A little bit of something can affect something much larger. And to be honest with you, personally, I'm glad that yeast works through dough. Because I don't know about you, but I love me some carbs. Like a good Panera Asiago cheese bagel with a little butter spread on it, which makes my wife gag because she thinks it smells like fish or something. I don't know. It is just pure heaven to me. More so in the fall than on a 90-degree Sunday, right? Or, or in the fall when my wife makes her own homemade bread and then some potato soup to go with it. Oh, it is so good. I love the fact that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. But it can also work on the flip side, can it? A little bit of something can also turn to make something really bad. 
this afternoon. For example, say you're out playing with your child, grandson, neighbor, relative, doing whatever. You work up a good sweat, and I come to you, hey, brought you this nice glass of cold water. I see your sweat, and you probably need to produce, you know, replenish your electrolytes. So I only put a little bit, of, I put like a tablespoon of salt in it. Here you go. Drink up. Would you accept the glass of water? Do you go to the ocean and take a drink? No, because it tastes like salt water. Right? Or, oh, I'm sorry. My bad. You know, we have a beautiful swimming pool in our backyard. Please feel free to come over and use our pool. It is here at your convenience. Come and swim whenever you want. I'll let you know there's a couple kids swimming in it earlier. They only peed in it a little bit. It's not a big deal. Would you go swimming in my pool? Thanks, God. I think we're heading to Bald Eagle for the afternoon, right? Of course you wouldn't because a little bit of yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Depending on the age and a little bit of something has a way of working through the larger component to make it relatively unstable or unusable in some instances. And in a short time, we are going to be partaking of unleavened bread as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And while I do enjoy unleavened bread, I am very thankful for leavening agents, such as the yeast that it takes to make the bread that I usually eat. This issue of circumcision that we discussed last week, this issue of circumcision that is brought up in our passage today, is the agent that is working through the church in Galatia, causing it to be infected with legalism instead of being infected with Christ. This circumcision issue is the little bit of yeast that is being referred to here. What's verse 11 say? Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. The very thing that Paul once persecuted others for is the very thing that Paul is personally and currently being persecuted for. Circumcision and obedience to the law meant everything. To the Judaizers, and they once did to Paul as well, until he had his experience with Christ. Why do you think, if it wasn't about legalism, why were they so threatened about the words that Paul said? When Paul said, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Why did that threaten him? Why did it threaten him when Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free? Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Or you want to throw out a passage that's going to scare the pants off of somebody who is really into legalism? Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Listen to what Paul writes. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but live according to the Spirit. Paul was a threat for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a threat to the Judaic law, it was a threat to their traditions, and it was a threat to their religious comfort levels. So the religious leaders did what the religious leaders do so often, back then as well as today. They persecute and condemn. You see, Paul preached freedom in Christ when they emphasized the rules of religion. Paul taught relationship. They taught unadulterated and unquestioned obedience. Paul emphasized the words of Christ himself. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Paul's life embodied those words. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? It's really all about Jesus. It's really all about Jesus. 
you know, when I became a pastor, um, shortly before I moved up here, the pastor at the church we came from said, Scott, those words, it's all about Jesus. Preach Jesus, you'll be good. It's all you need to do. There's a lot of truth in those words. There's a story I want to read out of this book. It's called And the Angels Were Silent by Max Lucado, which ties together the message and the communion just about perfectly. It, it's, I've just been browsing through this. If I have a couple minutes, you know, over the last two, three weeks, I read a chapter. It's just a couple pages long. But I read this this week. I think it was Wednesday. I picked this up and read it and thought, man, that, it's good stuff. And it really helps connect what we're doing here today. Max Lucado says, when I was a young boy, I was part of a church corps that took communion to the shut-ins and the hospitalized. We visited those who were unable to come to church but still desired to pray and partake of communion. I must have been 10 or 11 years of age when we went to one hospital room that housed an elderly gentleman who was very weak. He was asleep, so we tried to wake him. Couldn't wake him. We shook him. We spoke to him. We tapped him on the shoulder, but we couldn't stir him. We hated to leave without performing our duty, but we didn't know what to do. One of the young guys with me observed that even though the man was asleep, his mouth was open. Why not, we said. So we prayed over the cracker, stuck a piece on his tongue. Then we prayed over the grape juice and poured it down his mouth. He never woke up. Neither do many of us today. For some, communion is a sleepy hour in which wafers are eaten and juice is drunk and the soul never stirs. It wasn't intended to be as such. It was intended to be an I can't believe it's me, pinch me, I'm dreaming invitation to sit at God's table and be served by the king himself. When you read Matthew's account of the Last Supper, one incredible truth surfaces. Jesus is the person behind it all. It was Jesus who selected the place, designated the time, and set the meal in order. The chosen time is near. I will have Passover with my followers at your house. And at the supper, Jesus is not a guest, but the host. He gave to his disciples. The subject of the verbs in the messages of this event. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. And at the supper, Jesus is not the served, but the servant. It is Jesus who, during the supper, put on the garb of a servant and washed his disciples' feet. Jesus is the most active one at the table. Jesus is not portrayed as the one who reclines and receives, but as the one who stands and gives. He still does. The Lord's Supper is a gift to you. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, not a sacrifice. Often we think of the Supper as a performance, a time when we are on stage and God is the audience, a ceremony in which we do the work and He does the watching, and that's not how it was intended. If it was, Jesus would have taken His seat at the table and relaxed, but that's not what He did. He instead fulfilled His role as a rabbi by guiding His disciples through the Passover. He fulfilled His role as a servant by washing their feet, and He fulfilled His role as a Savior by granting them forgiveness of sins. He was in charge. He was on center stage. He was the person behind and in the moment, and He still is. It's the Lord's table that you sit at. It's the Lord's Supper you eat. Just as Jesus prayed for his disciples, Jesus begs God for us. When you are called to the table, it might be an emissary who gives the letter, but it is Jesus who wrote it. It is a holy invitation, a sacred sacrament bidding you to leave the chores of life and enter his splendor. He meets you at the table. And when the bread is broken, Christ breaks it. When the wine is poured, Christ pours it. And when your burdens are lifted, it's because the king in the apron has drawn near. Think about that next time you go to the table.